What's going on guys? Anno 1800 is quite the large and layered game. There are hundreds of different layouts for your buildings, expeditions you undertake that can get you some unique items and specialists, dealing with ships and naval combat, and watching as your ships or even the AI ships come into port to buy and sell and drop off goods. New players, or even those of you who have been playing for a little while but may still be struggling with things, you often get overwhelmed by everything going on. So in this series on the channel, we take a look at five tips every week or so that might help you with understanding a little bit more about this game. So let's jump right in and see if we can't shed some light on a few things you might not know about. So starting off, let's take a look at building layouts. Now, most people go to the Anno 1800 wiki or to the website annolayouts.de. Uh, links to all of that is going to be in the description, of course. And they go there trying to figure out how to best lay out their industrial complexes or their farmlands and everything to make the most use of space. Or you may not even know how to even set things up in the first place and you need a little guidance. But here's a little trick you may not know. Not everything has to be connected by roads everywhere. So let me explain what I mean by that a little bit. So here we have a very simple layout for beer. You have, a, you have three, grain far, uh, three hop farms, you have two grain farms, a malt house, two breweries, and a warehouse. It's a very simple layout. It's a very basic layout, and it gets you everything you need. Everything is nicely connected by roads, and everyone can deliver their goods. But here is the trick. Check this one right here out. It's a little bit different because this one I'm only using uh, two row tiles right here, or I could even use a single row tile if I move the warehouse up just one to connect the breweries only to the warehouse. The grain farms and the hop farms and the malt house are on their own separate road network going only to the brewery right here. The mechanics of this are very simple. So long as something in the chain is connected to a road that connects to a trading post in your harbor, everything else is considered connected as well. This works really, really well for simple inputs like a one-to-one -one or a two-to-one ratio, kind of like the two grain farms to one malt house or one malt house to two breweries. You can even do something as simple as a lumberjack and a sawmill. We'll take a look right here. You can see I have the, the lumberjack hut connected directly to the sawmill, which is now connected to the warehouse. And that's it. I don't have to have roads going everywhere. This saves you a little bit of coin, and it saves on some space. Now, of course, you won't stockpile any of the raw or intermediate goods, such as logs or malt or grain or hops. You won't stockpile any of that. But if you're constantly using them up to either supply your people or you're selling them on trade routes for money, then you would not be stockpiling those things anyways, so it's not really a loss. Now, it's not always the most efficient layout, of course, but it is a neat little trick you can do if you want to not have roads going everywhere. I just discovered this one a few weeks ago, and I've been using it a lot for things like the sawmills right here and for my schnapps, sheep farms, Different things like that I've been using it on. It's a great little trick, and I really hope you find some fun little uses for it in your cities. So moving on, let's talk about those expeditions. These adventures you send your ships out on can be a little mm, nondescript if you don't take the time to check them out. Many times people are trying to find uh, very rare legendary animals like the snowflake sets or something, and they struggle finding one. Well, there's actually a really uh, helpful way you can try to find out what you're looking for easier. Whenever you get a notice about a, an expedition to pop up, you'll see them over here in the expeditions tab or the expeditions button right here where you can see them all. What you can do is you can actually go to the world map and look for those markers on the world map. So you can see right here, we've got an archeological expedition in the rainforest. We have one over here in the dry plains. We have over here in the Southern woodlands, the temperate forest, the winter forest, and one up here in the polar. Those are 
very specific destinations. Temperate forest, winter forest, polar, dry plains, southern woodlands, and the rainforest. Certain animals, like the black jaguar for instance, only come from a place like the rainforest. Polar regions give polar bears, winter forests give uh, things like caribou or some of those other more northern animals like that. So, but now as of the time of this video being made, no one has made an exhaustive list of all the different rare animals or even the museum pieces and where they can come from on the world map. So unfortunately, I cannot go into more detail or even link something like that. But just know that if you're missing a certain animal for a set, think about what type of animal it is and where it could come from realistically in the world. You wouldn't find, uh, you know, an animal that could normally only be found in the rainforest over in, you know, maybe the temperate forests, things like that. You have to consider where it might come from. Uh, don't forget, you can search for items you are missing in the item tab of the stat screen or uh, by clicking Control T. Just be sure to select All Islands and tick the Unknown box, then type in the name of the set. You'll see the ones you're missing are kind of grayed out a little bit. So, happy hunting, and at some point, maybe we can get a really good list of where all the different rare animals can be found in all of these different locations. It's something I am clamoring for. Maybe if I have time, I'll work on that list, and I can share it with you all. For the third spot, let's uh, stay on the same boat, if you will, and let's talk ships. Specifically, our precious trade ships, our cargo ships and clippers and schooners. Without these haulers, our economies would collapse in a fiery rebellion and we would lose all of our money and we would get that awful you lose screen. The biggest threat to our ships is from other people. Pirates and other AI you're at war with will love to chase and try to sink your trade ships, denying your people the things they need and the things you need to make money. One of the more common solutions I see for this is to protect your trade routes with fleets of ships patrolling around and, of course, just take out the enemy and be done with it. But what if you're not in, in a position to do that? Or what if you want to farm their ships for valuable specialists or items? Well, we have a solution for that, which can keep our ships safe at the same time. It is called the White Flag. This beauty of an item comes in two varieties epic and legendary which has an added bonus of minus 15 percent trade prices on it the epic version can be purchased at old nate or rarely at isabella you can find it by diving with a salvager on pirate or rescue missions or expeditions or if you have willy wibblestock in the game he can give that as a quest reward sometimes or even be found on his ships or uh, on his islands if you take them over the legendary one can only be found as a random quest reward from Willy or Isabella, or on a hostile takeover of Willy's Islands, rescue or pirate expeditions, open diving, or one of three different diving maps, Willy's Wondrous Stash, Isabella's Emergency Vault, or Vincente's Sunken Ship of the Line. So what the flag does is it sets the ship that is equipped on to be in a permanent peace mode and it can never be attacked it is literally immune to ever being damaged by anyone when you have three to four cargo ships constantly bringing in precious coffee or rum or even chocolate like mine right here is uh, that you need to have to keep that income going losing those ships to enemy attacks can be devastating as soon as I can, I start rolling at night, doing expedition and diving as much as possible to find these things. They, first of all, go in my high priority, uh, high priority routes, like the coffee or rum ships, and then I start equipping them in others, depending on how crucial that route is to me. My goal in any playthrough is to have as many, if not all, of my trade ships equipped with a white flag. This ensures my trade routes can never be hindered, and it takes so much stress off of me. They are a huge, huge lifesaver. So my ships don't need lifesavers when they get sunk. 
Yeah, I'm here with the puns today. I'll be here all week, guys. So uh, keep an eye out for white flags and get those in your ships if you're dealing with aggressive neighbors and never worry about losing a route again. And speaking of income, let's get that chocolate delivered and get this peaceable ship going back to the New World to pick up some more Hershey's for us. Fourth on the list today, we're staying with the ship theme here and we're talking about loading speed. This is a somewhat mysterious and misunderstood stat which is asked about often and there has been very little information about it. So let's take it apart a bit because I spent the time researching it. Let's start by saying what loading speed is not. It is not a stat that is based on the type of ship being loaded or unloaded. I see a lot of people claiming that airships are better because they unload faster or schooners unload really slow. This is completely wrong. What loading speed actually is, is based on the building, the trading post, or the pier. It works like this. Your basic small trading post that you first build has a loading speed of two tons of goods per second with a minimum of five seconds to be spent at the dock. Do know that this is game time, not always real time. So if you have the game sped up, it's going to go faster. So if you are loading or unloading a cargo ship full of 300 goods on a trade route, it will take 150 seconds or two and a half minutes to load or unload all of it at a small trading post. The worker tier medium post slightly increases this to three tons of goods per second. So 100 seconds or a minute and 40 seconds for 300 tons of good. The large trading post in engineers is a much nicer five tons per second. So only 60 seconds for 300 tons of goods. The new grand warehouse that came with update eight has no change in the loading speed though. It's the same as a large trading post. The main benefit of the grand trading post is more loading ramps for carts and storage space. The pier building is unique in that it has a constant speed of two tons of goods per second, regardless of the harbor level. It does not change at all. It always stays at two tons of goods per second. No, uh, it does not matter what the harbor level is that it is a part of. So now that we know how loading speed works as a base level, let's check out how items and specialists that affect loading speed works. Now it's a simple formula that takes the base loading time and divides it by the sum of the percent plus one. Yes, I know math. Let's just take an example using an item that many people get from sunken treasures. That would be Hogarth here. Hogarth the Harbor Master, veteran of Trelawney. He is obtained by completing the main quest for Crown Falls. He increases loading speed by 100%. So if we had a grand trading post right here, which has a loading speed of 5 tons per second, which means a base loading speed of 60 seconds. Then we are going to take that and divide it by two. That two is, uh, you have to you know do the decimal moving thing. So the 100%, you move the decimal to the left two spaces. So it becomes one and then you add one to it then you divide 60 seconds by two. And so you get 30 seconds. That is how long Hogarth um, lets the grand trading post and the large trading post unload goods now. It's actually very easy. Um, it's not very complicated. There are quite a few items and everything that affect loading speed. You can find all of those in the item, uh, item search tab. So like if you had an item that did 60% and a 45% slotted into a ship, uh, ships typically are the ones that have the uh, loading speed items in them, you equip some of those in a ship, then it's going to be reduced to 29 seconds. That's 60 divided by 2.05.
I'm going to have examples pinned in the comments below so you can get a better idea if you need it. Uh, just because it, it can be a little weird, but I will have examples pinned in the comments just so you can get a better idea of how to do the math and everything. But that is how loading speed works. And I found this information very, very handy when I learned it. And I really hope it sheds some light on a kind of foggy mechanic in the game. So we're getting out of the water for the last thing today. I want to talk a bit about island attractiveness and why it matters. Attractiveness is the sum total points of how nice or how ugly your island is. You can see your total attractiveness rating and get a breakdown of everything affected, uh, affecting it by clicking on the city attractiveness button, that is this one right here, on the right side of the main center UI, and it brings up this menu right here for your city attractiveness. This thing right here tells you where all, how many points you have in each category, and you can click the card to see a breakdown of how much you're getting from different sources. Those being culture, nature, festivities, vulgarity, pollution, and instability. Uh, things like the World's Fair can give festivity bonuses when you're doing exhibitions. Festivals give festivity bonuses, but you do lose that, of course, whenever that ends. So I tend not to pay attention to what's under festivity. I only look at these right here. St instability also should go away as long as you're not, you know, being terrible. But these four right here are your main ones and everything that you want to pay attention to. Now, most things are obvious of how much it adds since it shows you right on the building that it will add X amount of attractiveness. Uh, but nature and ornaments, we don't have any numbers associated with them in the game. But we do know those numbers because of the game files. One tile of nature gives 0.0075 points of attractiveness. But it does have a base amount of at least 50 points, so no matter what, You'll get a minimum, a bare minimum of 50 points of attractiveness on a brand new island before you start developing it. Ornaments have a value of somewhere around 0 point, uh, 0 0.07 to 0 0.09 per tile. The amount does seem to vary slightly. Um, I've not been able to get a good read on exactly that amount. But it's somewhere around there. Uh, so, you know, nature and ornaments, they're not going to give you a ton of attractiveness, but they do add up over time as you place them. Your main sources are obviously going to be your culture. Your culture stuff is going to be the big things, your World's Fair, your museums, zoos, and botanical gardens, as well as if you have the seat of power, you can get attractiveness from the palace and certain policies and everything. There are also a specialist and items that give attractiveness. There's lots of different ways to get attractiveness. Now, negative things such as pollution, vulgarity, riots, illness, and war all decrease your attractiveness. Again, you can see all of that right here at the bottom. Um, now, pollution and vulgarity are the two that I see a lot of new players ask about constantly. They want to know things like, should I keep my factories away from the population so I don't have pollution? And unfortunately, that's just not how it works. Pollution and vulgarity are island-wide. It does not matter where you place those buildings. You're going to get the negative, uh, the negative uh, penalty on your island no matter where you build that thing. The, the only way to really negate these effects is either by moving them to another island or by clever use of items and specialists and trade unions that remove their negative ratings. But I don't really recommend doing it that way since it's to me it's a waste of a trade union. Uh, just move them to another island if you have to. So why does all of this matter? Two answers. Money and the palace. If you have seat of power, of course. The public mooring is a once per island artisan tier building that you need. Uh, um, see, trying to get my thoughts in order here. The public mooring is a once per island artisan tier building that lets visitors come to your island and they give you money in the form of tourism income. The amount of income is your total attractiveness multiplied by 3.6. 
So you figure in the maintenance cost of the mooring and you need at least 112, 112 attractiveness in the old world and 70 attractiveness on an island in the new world in order to start making a profit from the uh, public mooring. Since they don't cost any influence to build, you could build these on any island you have that has over those numbers and get some really easy income from them. It updates about every 30 minutes to take into account any changes in your island's rating. So if you did a bu if you bumped it up a whole lot with like new zoos and all sorts of things, it's not going to be instant. You're going to have to wait for the next visitors to come around about every 30 minutes and they will update how much you're making from it then. The other purpose uh, the other purpose for attractiveness is the palace. So the seat of power added the palace, as we all well know, and the palace has different policies associated with it based on your attractiveness level. As you can see right here, I have unlocked everything. The final unlock is the naval logistics, which is unlocked at, I believe it is 9,000 attractiveness, unlocks the naval logistics policy. And then... After that, you get prestige levels. The prestige levels are what's really, really cool here. The, every 1,000 attractiveness after 9,000, you can upgrade into these prestige levels. What these things do is they upgrade the base, uh, the base default effect for each department. You can see right here, the base default for the department administration is plus 50 workforce on the island. Mine is at plus 80 because I'm at prestige level 3, so I get an extra 30. I'm getting an additional 12% increase uh, visits from specialists. I'm getting an additional 6% productivity, another 6 range for public buildings, and an additional 120 storage. So all of these increase every prestige level. Uh, the highest I have seen someone get to is prestige level 28, and it was absolutely absurd, the bonuses they got from it. It is really, really cool. Attractiveness is such a huge, huge asset to your game, and you should dedicate your largest island, whether it be Crown Falls or an island of the old world, whatever you want to put it on, and get the most space and get as much attractiveness as possible to get money coming in. As you saw down there, mine was bringing in, I believe it was like 40,000. Was that then the, the number I had? Yeah, I'm making 40,000 off of mine with 11,000 11, attractiveness. It is absolutely obscene. It's a great way to make money. The palace, is, the palace boosts are amazing with high attractiveness. So definitely think about doing that. And that's it, folks. Those are my five tips this time for Anno 1800. I hope you found something useful or something you might not know about, might not have known about. Do you have some tips you want to share? You know, leave a comment down below and let me know. And be sure to subscribe and hit that notification bell so I, you always know when I upload a video. Sorry for the uh, a bit, you know, losing my words here and there ran out of water about halfway through and cotton mouth is so such a bad thing uh i'll fix it later so anyways guys thanks so much for watching and take care